I'm Alex Gupta with UATV. Today I'll be speaking with Dr. Katerina Smagli. She is the director of the Kinnan Institute in Ukraine. Hello, doctor. Welcome to the studio. Thank you very much, Alex. Pleasure meeting you. What impact is civil society having on reforms in domestic politics today since Maidan? Wow, uh, thank you very much for picking up the subject of civil society in Ukraine. This is an extremely important area, and as you understand, uh, it is critically important nowadays for Ukraine's democratization, modernization, and reform. Um, as you remember, immediately after Euromaidan, uh, uh, dozens of civil society groups have emerged. And uh, with Western support, Ukraine has organized itself in a number of reform groups, which had been working not only with the cabinet of ministers with U of Ukraine, the presidential administration, and also independently uh, established um, networks, such as reanimation package of reforms, which started various activities to support intellectually uh, and uh, as a matter of advice advocacy campaigns, uh, various areas where the government needed support in the areas of reforms. I think uh, the animation reform package is a, is a particularly good example of where Ukraine has succeeded in reforming various areas ranging from education, culture and uh, anti-corruption areas. Are these groups, are they, are they working together? Is there you know, communication, interdependence, are they really working together now? Uh, yes, the animation package of reform, its uniqueness is lies in the fact that it is a horizontal network of, of uh, civil society groups and think tanks which had united voluntarily, nobody has assigned them to do so. They work in 26 independent groups uh, united by thematic areas and they uh, meet on a weekly basis and discuss progress that had been made by the Rada, uh, by the cabinet of ministers and together with uh, representatives from the government they investigate additional areas where reform efforts are necessary and they draft legislation which uh, later is submitted to the Verkhovna Rada via national deputies and then voted in the Rada and etc. Do you think civil society is acting as a proper check on the government? Well, you, you must understand that we have always to um, see Ukraine's situation in context. Uh, we know our institute implements a very important project, which is called Ukraine's with one's own eyes. We bring uh, every month groups of Russian civil society activists and try to uh, familiarize them with Ukraine's know-how in the area of reforms and uh, modernization and democratization. And when Russian activists meet with groups such as reanimation package of reform, they become really impressed because they tell us that nothing like this exists in the Russian Federation today and that U Ukraine's example is really unique. Um, but coming back to your questions, yes, of course, these areas, these reform efforts, they do uh, help Ukraine. They do keep government on track. Uh, of course, uh, we may argue that uh, civil society groups sometimes lack um, unity, sometimes they lack dialogue with the regions. But believe me, uh, all these negative elements are being taken into consideration and the animation package of reform is doing uh, much more nowadays to reach out to the regions and to bring as many voices from the uh, uh, on the ground what, to the reform process. How what improvements could be made? How could they you know, help themselves to become even more vocal and become even more influential? Uh, I believe they should strengthen their dialogue with society at large. Uh, I think we need uh, nowadays a public platforms where various analysts, civil society leaders, meet more often with people like you and me and discuss their daily needs and they discuss whether those reforms which had already been implemented, whether they bring any result, whether people feel this result. I think what Ukraine really needs is this public spaces for debate. Unfortunately, these days, the, the elements of communication between analysts, civil society activists and ordinary citizens is still missing. So you're saying there's a, there's a gap, there's a pretty big gap still between, you know, civil society at the base and then government at the, the high end. There's still, a, you know, still needs to be a medium for communication between these two groups. Yes, yes, and civil society should itself, I mean, we should always differentiate between organized civil society mm -hmm. and uh, grassroots organizations, non-organized civil society groups. I think the organized group, which are non-profits, registered civil society organizations, it is their task nowadays to, to engage uh, citizens into this dialogue. Because, as you remember, during Euromaidan, thousands of people been uh, at the Maidan Square. It's been a mass involvement of citizens, and of course, 
Euromaidan by itself had been a great demonstration of Ukraine civil society participation. Since then, after three years, you know, the spirit of Maidan has evaporated. Mm -hmm. People kind of got back to their normal life. They are no longer as involved. They, they no longer, some of them has even became disillusioned. And uh, for us to keep on track and to keep pushing the government towards reform, we need to involve these people as, as broadly as we can. What would help bring back that enthusiasm that we saw here in 2004? What could be done? I believe there is a great promise with newly formed uh, political parties, uh, the parties which are led by Euromaidan activists. And here I'd like to mention parties like Democratic Alliance, which is led by Vasily Hatsko, Svetlana Zelishchuk, uh, the party like Sila Luday, the power of the people. One of its leaders is Oleksandr Solontai, recipient of NDI Democracy Award immediately after the Euromaidan. And I believe these parties, which had already started the dialogue with uh, uh, society, they should kind of become more engaged and they should uh, do this regional reach out um, and, and they should double their efforts for this regional reach out. What do you think, what is the difference between in 2004 we had the Orange Revolution, 2014 we had Euro Maidan, what is the difference? Do you see a difference between then and now? Yes, of course. There is a tremendous difference. I would like to uh, remind you that immediately after uh, the Orange Revolution, which was a there was a big euphoria. You know, we, we all believe that Ukraine has reached this moment of the end of history. And everyone thought at that moment that Yushchenko's government will do everything to keep Ukraine on the track of democracy. I believe that some civil society organizations, they kind of lost their monitoring function. They stopped serving as watchdogs on the government because of this strong belief, you know, that Ukraine has been indeed a very good example of success story, you know, of democratization. But we have learned our mistakes. I believe those victims, the people who had sacrificed their lives at the Maidan, they will always be a reminding point for thousands of activists in Ukraine nowadays that we should that we should never slide back, that we should stay on track, and that what, whatever happens, no matter how much pressure is put by the government on civil society activists, they should continue monitoring, watching, sounding the alarm, uh, advocating the interests of ordinary citizens, advocating the reform agenda to uh, ensure that there would be no return to authoritarianism in Ukraine. Well, that's interesting. You talk about how there needs to be watchdogs, and mm -hmm. there was a lack of that in 2004. Do you think that, and now, now there probably is more, do you think more international organizations, more Western organizations, more even Western think tanks, you know, such as NDI, IRI, they need to be more involved, which they, which they are to no, a certain there extent. Is a, there is one very substantial difference. Uh, immediately after Euromaidan, at least 20 former civil society activists have been elected to the Rada. And now they make the backbone of civil society watchdog within the government, because Verkhovna Rada is one of the branches of government, right? Of course, they are not yet make the critical mass of civil society activists who can kind of uh, push the reform agenda, push the Europe European uh, integration agenda. Nevertheless, the fact that they are in the Rada makes them more give them more opportunities to them to have the microphone they have greater access now to the media they can speak to the public and they uh, a big hope for ukraine you know the very fact that this is a big difference with the orange revolution because after the orange revolution we had maybe two or three civil society activists who'd been elected to the rada now we have at least two dozens of them in the Rada. And this is, a, this is a great difference. And I believe that in the next parliamentary elections, if this group succeed, and I have already mentioned groups like Democratic Alliance and Sila Lude, if they succeed in mobilizing more supporters, we'll, we'll see more new faces in the Rada. And that would be the bigger uh, hope for Ukraine to succeed. Going back to international organizations, mm -hmm, international right. think tanks, is there any incentive well, first, do domestic politicians or politicians in Ukraine, do they even listen to think tanks? And is there any incentive to listen to them? Uh, you know, there are a lot of very good, very strong think tanks. And I must uh, acknowledge that in the last 10 years, the quality of our analytical work has increased dramatically. There is a very famous rating of think tanks, uh, the so-called the Magan uh, rating, which is produced in the United States. Uh, only five years ago, we had only one Ukrainian think tank represented there. This is the Razumkov Center. Uh, uh, since last year, we already have five Ukrainian think tanks 
uh, ranked there, including the Institute for World Policy, the Foundation, Democratic Initiatives Foundation, even one regional think tank from Dnipropetrovsk had been listed there. So this is a demonstration that the quality of research and analytics in Ukraine has improved dramatically. Whether or not these analytical centers have an impact on government, whether the government listens to uh, policy recommendations that they make, this is a big question. Uh, although uh, the very fact that uh, Ukraine's current ambassador to the United States, Valery Chali, is a former employee, the former analyst of the Razumkov Center, is already a sign, you know, that the President Poroshenko does pick up uh, intellectuals, uh, that he does need support of uh, uh, policy analysts to kind of support his own uh, political process. Well, great. Thank you so much, doctor. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Alex. This is Alex Gupta with UATV. I was just speaking with Dr. Smagley of the Kennan Institute in Ukraine. We were discussing think tanks, civil society, and reform in Ukraine. Thank you so much.